The drum call is to call the entire village, young and old, to come and join us. Something is about to happen. In this case, what's about to happen is a libation, which is being poured in honor of our creator and our ancestors. I promise to assume the responsibility in continuing on the path of progress and build upon the foundation you have laid before us. And to remember and honor those who walked and worked before us and thus paved the path down which we now walk. That's okay. We need cleansing. I'd like to introduce Dr. Joyce McNichols, who are key, no speaker today. Joyce has been doing this work for over 23 years in our community. Joyce has tackled some of these institutions that continue to this day that have oppressive policies that impact individuals like yourselves in this room. She has put herself out there to talk about the importance of communities of color that have been dying over decades of years and generation. As an educator, she's been trying to, not trying to, but as an educator, she continues to lead in providing education into the institutions of those that sit in the power seats. Joyce also has been teaching, you know, anti-racist trainings, you know, through some of our grassroots organizations, through some of our youth development that, are, that don't know the history and understand how to deal with some of this, this oppressive ways um, in society today. Joyce has been targeted, you know, because of, in a positive way. Targeted meaning that she is one of the leaders that we have called in our community of color to be able to continue to educate those around the table that not have an understanding of what social justice is, may not have an understanding even for those that do the work, to be an ally, but understand sometimes it can cause more harm than good. So today we're gonna to hear Dr. Joyce McNichols and I want you all to give her a warm welcome. Please stand and welcome my personal friend, Dr. Joyce McNichols. So today is a day that we celebrate and recognize the legacy of Dr. King. Now all around the country, people will likely pull quotes from his I Have a Dream speech, some aspects of Martin's life, and that's okay, because that I Have a Dream speech is a fantastic speech. Some aspects of Martin's life have been glossed over though, making it easy to forget that his actions and words were seen by many as controversial and radical during his time. In fact, there were blacks and whites who considered him a radical and a threat to the social order. And y'all, a lot of you know how J. Edgar Hoover had his phone tapped, okay? So I asked my 80-year-old mother, who grew up in segregated Mississippi, what she remembered people saying about Martin Luther King back in the 1960s. She said, what do you mean? What white folks said about him or what black folks said about him? She says, all I know was that we didn't mention his name around white folks. They would get mad. Imagine that, Martin Luther King Jr., the man who has a holiday in his honor, the man who has streets named after him, the man whose face is on a postage stamp, was that controversial that my mother had to watch where she was, who she was saying his name around, okay? Yes, that I Have a Dream Martin was considered by many to be a radical and a threat. 
So we gather here today to celebrate and reclaim his radical legacy. So I'm going to talk about and quote the Martin that we don't often hear about at the community celebrations. I'm going to talk about his radical words and actions and what they can teach us as we fight for racial and economic justice. I think I might be able to handle it. Okay. Throughout my remarks this morning, I think I can handle it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I will refer to Martin, uh, Martin Luther King as Martin which is a very unorthodox thing for me to do, considering that I was raised by traditional Southern African-American parents. I was taught to refer to elders and socially prominent people by their proper names, Mr. So-and-so, Miss So-and-so. So why am I referring to Dr. King? Oh, thanks, Julius. Thank so why am I referring to Dr. King by his first name? After all, Martin was a civil rights leader a minister, an author, a Time Magazine Man of the Year in 1963, a Nobel Peace Prize winner with a PhD in theology. Certainly, I should be referring to him more formally, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. After all, I did not know him. I didn't know him personally. But I call him Martin because in a manner of speaking, I do know him. But not in the personal sense. The word knowing means having an awareness and a consciousness about someone or something. Let me explain by drawing on the image of the Sankofa. The Sankofa is a mythical bird in West African culture that flies with his body facing forward while his head is looking backwards. It symbolizes that we should remember our past and be aware of our ancestors and that we should take what's good from the past, bring it to the present, to help us make change in our lives. Another symbolism of the Sankofa is that we must know where we've been if we want to know where we're going. Today, I say I know Martin because I find myself being consciously aware of him, particularly when I've thought about all the young black men who are being killed by the police over the last few years. This holiday, the third Monday in January, the third day the day we celebrate the legacy of Dr. King has the potential to be like many holidays in our country, just another opportunity for a three-day weekend and some good sales. We don't forget the good sales. It can be a holiday that passes without any real substantive observance of who Martin was, what he did, or the radical things he said about racism and other forms of injustice. This holiday should be more than a day for Americans of different racial groups to come together and sing, we shall overcome. I never said I could sing, but. <laughs> it should be more than just a day for making ourselves feel good by acknowledging how much progress we've made. Yeah, we have come a long way. I mean, look, okay, we elected a black man to the presidency, not once, but twice. We have a black attorney general We've had two black Secretary of States. This holiday, I guess it should be a day for celebrating Martin's contributions and patting ourselves on the back for how well we've come. But it should also be a day for exposing the current injustices in our communities. Now, why should we do this? We should do it because I believe if Martin were alive today, that's exactly what he would be doing. He would be saying, black lives matter by exposing the racism that still exists today. Martin will be pointing out institutions in America that are directly or indirectly acting as if black lives don't matter, or have the same value, at least, as other lives. So I'm going to imagine a conversation that I'm having with one of my ancestors, Martin, right now. I'm going to pretend like I'm speaking to him in 1967, and imagine how he would respond when I tell him about the institutional racism that still plagues America today. Martin, did you know that African Americans and other racial minorities tend to receive lower quality health care and have worse outcomes than whites, even when they have the same insurance and income? And Martin, did you know that blacks and other racial minorities are less likely to be given the appropriate medication for heart disease? or to undergo bypass surgery and are less likely to receive kidney dialysis and kidney transplants when compared to whites. But 
Martin, listen to this. We are three times more likely to have lower limb amputations <laughs> as a result of diabetes than our white counterparts. What do you think about that, Martin? Well, Joyce, that sounds like black lives don't matter. Wait, Martin, there's more. Let's talk about education, Martin. Despite the 1954 Brown decision that declared segregated schools unconstitutional, and despite the, the desegregation efforts that took place in the 1960s through the 80s, Martin, you will be surprised to know that in the early 1990s, school di districts began to re-segregate. And Martin, I know you know that racially segregated schools produce unequal outcomes. Now listen to this, Martin. Nationwide, the average black kid attends a school where two-thirds of the kids are low income, whereas the average white kid attends one where it's just one-third of the students are low income. What do you think about that, Martin? Well, that sounds like black lives don't matter to me, Joyce. Wait, Martin, there's more. You know, and, you, and I know you know that the districts with lower poverty rates have more resources, and those with the higher poverty rates have fewer resources. Schools with higher concentration of poverty and kids of color have less access to qualified and experienced teachers, higher turnover rates among the staff, larger class sizes, fewer advanced placement courses, poorer infrastructure, and fewer basic educational supplies. Well, Joyce, that sounds like black lives don't matter. But well, wait, Martin. In the 20 largest school districts in the country, black kids are more than three and a half times likely to be suspended or expelled as their white counterparts. What do you think about that, Martin? That sure sounded like black lives don't matter. And Martin, don't get me started on the justice system. Listen to this, Martin. Let on, just listen. African Americans are not as likely as whites to be given the opportunity to plea bargain. And after going to trial, we are found guilty more often than whites, are more likely to get longer sentences than whites, and are less likely to be released on probation, even when we've come from the same economic background and have similar arrest records. What do you think about that, Martin? Black lives, some don't sound like it matters. Now, Martin, let me tell you about stop and frisk. In 2011, in New York City, young black and Latino males were disproportionately subjected to stops and frisk by the police. Although black and Latino males between the ages of 14 and 24 were only 5% of the city's population, they accounted for 42% of the stops. White New Yorkers were less likely to be frisked, but were more often found to be carrying weapons. And the sad thing is, Martin, that 90% of the young black and Latino men stopped were innocent of any criminal activity. What do you think about that, Martin? Sounds like black lives don't matter. Even the encounters we have with the police result in very different outcomes, Martin. We frequently experience police brutality, Martin. Still. Now, at this point, Martin just sat down. I'm like, I know, Martin. You probably, you probably think, what? We still experience the police brutality? Yep, we are, Martin. We are met with the use of force at a rate four times higher than whites when they encounter the police. And Martin, we're treated differently even in capital punishment cases. We are disproportionately placed on death row compared to whites. In 2012, Martin, blacks constituted just 13% of the U.S. population, yet we made up 43% of the prisoners on death row nationally. What do you think about that, Martin? Sound like black lives don't matter. Research has shown that when African Americans and whites commit the same crime against a white victim, the African American offender is more likely to receive the death penalty. Wait, Martin, there's more. And African-American kids are serving life sentences without parole at a rate that is 10 times higher than white youth. And they are more likely to be sentenced to adult prison. What do you think about that, Martin? Sounds like it don't matter. Now, I believe that Martin believes that black lives matter. And he would be using his radical voice to speak out against some of those things that I just said to you just now. He also will be speaking about issues of war and poverty. Yes. Yeah, and I said war and poverty in the same sentence. <laughs> the issues are connected. Yes. Martin was concerned about poverty to the point that he was calling, 
Now wait for it, wait for it. A redistribution of wealth. Mm -hmm. If some of the folks who are singing We Shall Overcome today at some of the celebrations honoring Martin around the country today, if they knew what Martin said about the gap between the rich and the poor, they probably would just sit right down right now and stop singing. When Martin and other leaders were planning the Poor People's Campaign, which was to include a march on Washington to bring national attention to the poverty of poor whites and people of color, he said, we are dealing with issues that cannot be solved without the nation spending billions of dollars and undergoing a, wait, you ready for it? A radical redistribution of economic power. Yes, Martin told us that we need to redistribute the wealth. Martin was concerned about poverty to the point that he was calling for something radical. Something so radical during that time, and in many circles today, very radical. Martin was also for equal pay and for workers' rights. He stood with the sanitation workers when they were striking in Memphis. He stood right with them. Martin was for unions. <laughs> Martin was anti-war and spoke out against it. He said, any nation that continues year after year to spend, and these aren't my words, these are Martin's words, more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. Martin would be disgusted by the insane amount of money spent on fighting and I'm putting this in air quotes, a war on terror. Why? Well, for several reasons. For one, because it's a diversion of resources that could be spent here on what he called then the social uplift of the poor. Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government calculated that we will have end up spending as much as $6 trillion on the decade-long wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. That's the equivalent of $75,000 to every American household. Now, how could I know he would be speaking up against that ridiculous amount of money today? Well, he spoke out against the billions that were being spent on Vietnam while people here at home were starving and living in poverty. That's why he said in his speech opposing the Vietnam War, a few years ago, there, there was a shining moment in that struggle. It seemed as if there was a real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white, through the poverty program. There were experiments, hopes, new beginnings. Then came the buildup in Vietnam, and I watched the program broken and eviscerated as if it were some idle political plaything of a society gone mad on war. And I knew that America would never invest the necessary funds or energies in rehabilitation of its poor so long as inventions like Vietnam continue to draw men and skills and money like some demonic, destructive, suction tube. So I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of the poor and to attack it as such. And that's why I say Martin would be saying something about today. He was also opposed to war because he saw that the promises of the great society had been shot down on the battlefields of Vietnam, making the poor, white, and Negro bear the heaviest burden, both at home and on, at, at, on the front and at home. Not much different from today when it comes to our recent wars. And Martin was just radical enough to point out the cruel irony of watching Negro, and this, this is a quote from Martin, the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same schools. Yes. So we watch them in brutal solidarity burning the huts of a poor village but we realized that they would never live on the same block in Detroit. Mm -hmm. He said he could not be silent in the face of such cruel manipulation of the poor. And you know what? Neither should we. That's right. He said he was going to speak out against the war even if others weren't. He didn't care. Martin did not care. He was compelled to call it out, even if others weren't. And today, we need to channel that radical spirit and behave in the same way. 
Martin was also opposed to war because he understood the hypocrisy of America's moral justification for using violence while quick to condemn the violence in the Watts riots and other places around the country. He said, as he's speaking about the folks involved in the riots and the, and the unrest, I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully through nonviolent action. But when they ask, and rightly so, what about Vietnam? They ask if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems, to bring about the change it wanted. Does this sound familiar? Today we have people condemning the very, very few incidents of property damage that a small number of protesters in Ferguson um, are, are accused of committing, just as quickly as people were condemning folks in the, white, uh, in the Watts riots. Martin said, I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. Yeah. And I ask you, how, how has that changed? We need to channel Martin, people. We need to channel Martin. We need to channel more than just that I have a dream, Martin. We need to channel and reclaim the radical Martin. Martin, Martin was also opposed to war because he knew that much of our justification for military actions against other nations is often just a smoke screen to cover many of our clandestine international and domestic interests and pursuits. Always. Always, yeah, you're right, always. <laughs> We have a history of undermining democracy all over the world by destabilizing governments, aiding and abetting military forces within countries to topple democratically elected governments when those governments oppose our interests. And I can't even begin to name all of them. I'm only just point out like one, one or two. Okay. And this is why Martin said, the American government says it's fighting for freedom and democracy against communism Yet America repeatedly undermines any serious chance of true democracy. And, why he, and this is why he also said, America made peaceful resolution impossible by refusing to give up the privileges and the pleasures that come from the immense profits of overseas investments. I keep telling you, we need to, we need to bring Martin back. <laughs> In his speech opposing the war, Martin laid it out very plainly how we were undermining democracy in Vietnam. And I urge everyone to read Martin's remarks about Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I can't put it all in it, but read it. One of the things that we, we, one of the things that I encourage people to do, and I do, and I do it for myself, is that I try to get a larger context before I start spouting out stuff about things. I don't know everything, I never claim to know everything, but I at least try to know some things before I start acting like I know everything. <laughs> Okay. So let's go back and read some stuff, all right? So in his speech opposing the war, he laid it out very plainly how we were undermining democracy in Vietnam. And if Martin were here today, he would be just radical enough to point out how we're still undermining democracy. He said America is morally sick. Unless America has a, a revolution of values, that will be more counter there will be more counter-revolutionary wars unless it puts people over profits, peace over war. We're undermining democracy and peace in Nigeria right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Syracuse University professor Horace Campbell, well, he was just on Democracy Now! last week, and he, and he said the Boko Haram struggle is about who will control the billions of dollars, yes. 10,000 barrels of oil per day that is oh. siphoned out of Nigeria. That's right. Mm -hmm. And Nigeria's Nobel Prize winner for literature, Woli Soyenka, said that Boko Haram is not a spontaneous, temporary, and isolated problem. 
It's a product of decades old political tactics. In fact, Soyinka said that there are elements within the Central Bank of Nigeria and the Nigerian government who are financing Boko Haram. And he believes the US government actually knows who these individuals are. He claims that the Nigerian president, good luck Jonathan, received a list from a foreign embassy with the names of the corrupt Nigerian officials. So Yinka believes that embassy was the United States government. Now, I don't know about you, but when I have somebody like Willis Yinka talking about stuff, I kind of listen, all right? And he's not the only one saying this. There's other folks saying these things. He's urged Good Luck Jonathan to present that list to the international community. Professor Campbell and Soyinka want to know what is the role of the U.S. government and the knowledge that they have about Boko Haram. I want to know. Professor Campbell told Amy Goodman on Democracy Now! that he questions the U.S. relationships with Nigerian government. Here's what he said. There was a vote at the United Nations about Palestine a month ago. John Kerry called the Nigerian government to pressure Jonathan to change his vote about, Pal about Palestine a half hour before the vote was made. Clearly, he goes on to say, they have information about the compromised leaders in the Nigerian government who are financing Boko Haram. Campbell and Soyinka and others want to know why aren't these names being brought to the African Union or to the United Nations so that there's an exposure of all the forces Kerry's phone call to President Jonathan was a gentle reminder to Jonathan that he better do what's, the, what's in the U.S.'s national and international interests. There's a lot at stake. Campbell said, Nigeria is by far the most dynamic force in Africa, and what everyone fears at this moment is the mobilization of the Nigerian people. As the people mobilize in Egypt or the people mobilize in Burkina Faso to remove corrupt elements. So there's a merger of forces of exploitation in Nigeria. Militias are being used against the people. No. The humiliation, the violation, and exploitation of women has reached the most obscene levels. And the accumulation by the Nigerian political class, 40% of the oil wealth from Nigeria is siphoned off by that political class. Some of those folks are probably on that list. The Boko Haram struggle, again, I'm repeating, is about what, what Professor Campbell said. It's about who will control the billions of dollars, the 10,000 barrels of oil per day that is siphoned out of Nigeria. And that, my friends, is how one, just one example of how we undermine democracy around the world. We create smoke screens to cover many of our clandestine international and domestic interests and pursuits. Now I want to take a few minutes and just talk about the role of silence. I want to say a few words, not just about silence, but how issues of injustice will eventually overlap. Martin didn't believe justice was bound by geography or borders or by issues. He knew that injustice in one place will eventually have an impact on other places. And that's why I'm, trying, I'm drawing some things from, my, from my, the international community as I'm going through this today. Now I'll give you an example. In 1963, Martin was asked by the citizens of Birmingham, Alabama, to go there to lead a march. They knew that Martin would attract a big crowd and the media. Now Birmingham, does anybody know what the nickname for Birmingham was? Birmingham, that's right. Because there had been 60 racially motivated unsolved bombings there. And right before Martin was asked to go there, a black man who was walking down the street was actually attacked and castrated by an angry mob. It was Easter weekend, and according to Andrew Young, who was with Martin at the time, Martin's father had told them that he should not be going over to Atlanta, I mean, going over to Birmingham. He should be in Atlanta at Ebenezer Baptist Church, his home church, doing the Easter sermon. But you see, Martin understood that although Atlanta had progressed towards integration faster than Birmingham, integration would be tenuous in Atlanta as long as segregation was less than 200 miles away in Birmingham. These things are overlapping, okay? So he marched in Birmingham, despite a court injunction forbidding him and the others from doing so. And while he was in jail, some of the white clergy in Birmingham wrote a statement that in, local, that in the local paper deriding Martin for leading a demonstration at Easter time. In solitary confinement, Martin responded 
to their comments by composing his famous letter from a Birmingham jail. And here's where I want to point out how you know we need to be concerned about what happens down the road from us or across the world from us, because Martin was. He said, my dear fellow clergymen, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities unwise and untimely. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere, and y'all can fill in the rest, justice, justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And that same sentiment applies today. We need to be aware of the injustices beyond our own communities and how whatever affects one of us is directly affecting all of us. And we must speak up. I stand with Martin when he says justice is indivisible. Those of us who are people of faith or connected to a spiritual practice should be the least silent. In fact, we should be the loudest. Martin knew this too. That's why he said when the church or the synagogue becomes a vocal or silent partner to the status quo, it loses both its power and its soul. I didn't say that. Martin said that. And that's why he said honesty impels us to admit that religious bodies in America have not been faithful to their prophetic, prophetic mission on the question of racial justice. In the midst of a nation rife with racial animosity, the church too often has been content to mouth pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities. And I know people, some folks are going to be like, oh, she's going to talk about this, but I, yeah, I'm talking about it. Okay? So when I see almost 2 million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip living under occupation in an area of land that's just 24, mile, 24 miles long and 6 miles wide, who have been under a military blockade. Now, let me just back up. A military blockade means nothing goes in, nothing comes out by land, by air or sea, unless the military allows it. So they've been under this blockade for, since 2007 that has resulted in an unemployment rate of over 35% with more than 80% of the population now dependent on international assistance for survival. So when I say, when I see that, I, when I say that justice is indivisible, I can't be silent if I really believe that justice is indivisible. When the U.S. on average is sending, spending $4 billion in aid to Israel without much of, it, with much of it going to the Israeli Defense Forces, but sends just $600 million on average a year to, for aid in Gaza, I say justice is indivisible. And I cannot and I won't be silent. So it didn't surprise me when I saw Palestinians standing in solidarity with the protesters in Ferguson. They've been living under what Professor Noam Chomsky referred to as the world's largest open air prison that doesn't allow them to leave except for under a few circumstances. I remember having a conversation with somebody a few months ago, when, um, last summer, uh, the end of the summer, when the, the recent um, violence, the, the war going on in Gaza. And somebody said, well, you know, things so bad, why don't they just leave? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so they walk the streets under constant buzzing surveillance of drones that we help to finance. There's so much silence in America about the plight of the Palestinians, Palestinian people. However, in most countries, and I've been, I've been in a lot of countries, okay? Not as many as Carlo, he's been in 64, but I've been in a lot, okay? Most countries around the world, there's nowhere near that same level of complicit silence. You know, and Martin would not be silent on this. That's why he said our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. He would be speaking out against any military action supported by American funds that produce the human suffering that we recently saw in Gaza and other places around the world, not just Gaza, because it's not so different than the suffering he observed the Vietnamese experienced during the war. This is why he spoke out and why he was just radical enough to stand in opposition 
to some of his peers. He said, if other civil rights leaders, for various reasons, refuse or can't take a stand or have to go along with the administration, that's their business. But I'm afraid tonight that I know that justice is indivisible and justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. He was radical. Martin put himself out there. He had people calling him saying, you don't need to be speaking out against the war of Vietnam. But he's like, you know what? Justice is indivisible. When I see the recent massacres in Nigeria and the relative silence from the American mainstream media and politicians, but they've expressed outrage over the terrorist attacks at the Charlie Hebdo's office in Paris, I know Martin would be saying, justice is indivisible. When I see celebrities, when I see celebrities showing solidarity with the 12 victims in the attack on Charlie Hebdo by wearing Jesuit's Charlie pens and bringing it up at the Golden Globe Awards, but not have anything to say about the Boko Haram terror attacks that killed 2,000 civilians in Nigeria. I say like Martin, justice is <laughs> Finally, and perhaps the most timely of all my remarks today, I just want to talk a little bit about the role of protest. Okay? I want to talk about what Martin taught us about the role of protest when fighting for racial and economic justice. I want to talk about how he viewed demonstrations, civil disobedience, and disruptive actions as a legitimate and strategic tactic. I wish, I wish Diane Williamson was here. He said, freedom is not some lavish dish that the white man will pass out on a silver platter while the Negro merely furnishes the appetite. If we're going to be free, we will have to suffer for that freedom. We will have to sacrifice for it. But I'm still convinced that there is nothing more powerful to dramatize an injustice than the tramp, tramp, tramp of marching feet. Yeah. Martin saw the power in people marching and protest. Many folks thought that the protesters in Ferguson were going to fade away. They thought the protests in Ferguson were going to stay in Ferguson. Uh -uh, well, I come to tell you, Ferguson ain't like Vegas, where what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> it ain't like Vegas. It's not like Vegas. Protests started springing up all over the country. Protests against police brutality, protests to say that Black Lives Matter. People started shutting stuff down. The people shut down Brooklyn Bridge. They shut down major highways all over the country. They just shut down I-93 last week in Boston. Mm. People are shutting stuff down all over with these disruptive actions. And so, you know, I just want to like jump out of my skin when folks want to try to bring up Martin to sit to somehow suggest that protests and disruptive <laughs> actions are inconsistent with no, 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 no. Shut up and read some of his you know, mm. the books. Read, read, read. You know. Some people thought we were going to forget about Mike Brown, Trevon Martin, Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, Sean Bell, Oscar Grant, all the I can't even say all of them, but we did not forget. We're not forgetting. After Kennedy was shot in 1963, Martin said, this is a 10-day nation that in 10 days is back to business as usual. You know we have a short attention span. He fully expected the nation to do what we typically do, which is to move on. But... If Martin were here today, I would say, Martin, I want to tell you that you be proud of us because we're not moving on. It's been more than 10 days, Martin. We're not moving on. We're not going back to business as usual. It's a new normal now because it's like Martin said then, we can never be satisfied as long as a Negro is a victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. Martin said... The only normalcy that we will settle for is the normalcy that recognizes the dignity and worth of all God's children. The only normalcy that we will settle for is the normalcy that allows judgments to run down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. The only normalcy that we will settle for is the normalcy of brotherhood, the normalcy of true peace, the normalcy of justice. And if that means that some folks might be inconvenienced by people protests, acts, peaceful protests, acts of disobedience, civil disobedience, or disruptive actions, so be it. Yes. So be it. Yes. Governor Christie, look, 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 listen, listen to this. Governor Christie inconvenienced, now he, he's claiming this didn't happen. Oh, yeah. He's claiming, he inconvenienced hundreds of thousands of people 
when four lanes of the New Jersey Turnpike were closed down for four days to punish a Democratic mayor who didn't support his gubernatorial re-election. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to be inconvenienced, I'd rather be inconvenienced for justice. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I know, I know, I know. Some of you probably saying, well, what's the point of these disruptive actions now? Well, well, what was the point of Martin and all the other shutting down roads as they marched from Selma? And this is just one march where we're talking about. The, what was the point? when they shut down the roads as they marched from Selma to Montgomery. It's, it was to raise awareness then that even though blacks had the right to vote on paper, that we couldn't exercise that right to vote in places like Selma. So I, ask, I submit to people who were poo-pooing all the protesters, what was the point of disruptive, disruptive action when people shut down the Brooklyn Bridge and all these other um, public um, highways and byways when they shut down I-93? It was to raise awareness about black men being killed by police officers, those few officers, not all officers, but the fact that black people were killed by officers who have acted as if black lives don't matter. So I say, keep on marching, keep on protesting. That's what Martin did. When Martin was planning the Selma to Montgomery march, President Johnson called him to get him to back off. You guys have to see, if, if you haven't seen Selma, go and see it. Yeah, Martin just laid it out plain. Give us what we want, and we won't have to march. He said, Mr. President, you can end this right now by passing voter rights legislation. Mm -hmm. Johnson tried to get Martin to be patient. Martin said, no, he said, just get, we're gonna get, do it, Martin. Just give us time. Martin's like, we waited long enough. Mm -hmm. you, and, and you know the rest. Mm -hmm. It's history. Martin marched anyway. Martin said, there is nothing wrong with marching in this issue. And this is the preacher of Martin that I love. He got, he gonna, he's gonna use the, the, the text, you know, to put right back at these racist folks who are claiming to be Christians. He's gonna use the text right back at them. He says, there's nothing wrong with marching in a sense. The, pipe, the Bible tells us that the mighty men of Joshua marched down the walls and wall city of Jericho and the barriers to freedom came tumbling down. Right. Following the days of protests and disruptive actions in Ferguson and St. Louis, President Obama invited a few young activists to meet with him in the Oval Office. And I said a few young activists. He didn't invite the old, you know, the folks that we used yep. to see, and you know, because the, the folks that are on the ground, the most adversely affected by this policing are the young folks, okay? The most adversely affected. And so they're putting some, you know, and when you got nothing to lose, you put yourself out there. So he invited, he invited these young folks, these activists. Here's what they said about that meeting. We walked out of that meeting unbought and unbowed, unbowed. We, we held no punches. There was no code switching, a boot licking, no concessions, no pot licking or posturing. The movement got this meeting, unearthed, unrest earned the invite, and we can't stop. If we don't get what we came for, we will shut it down. And President Obama, they said he knows that and we know it. These young folks were committed to more disruptive actions and protests, and they weren't going to stop until they got what they were asking for. They essentially told the president the same thing Martin told Johnson. So in closing, I suppose that we were kind of like the Sankofa this afternoon. We look back at Martin's radical legacy to help us make sense of our present so that we can move strategically towards our future, a future with racial and economic justice. When Martin arrived on the steps of the Capitol in Montgomery after marching with Selma, he said, we are on the move, and no wave of racism can stop us. We are on the move now. The burning of our churches will not deter us. The bombing of our homes will not dissuade us. We are on the move. The beating and killing of our clergymen and young people will not divert, divert us. We are on the move. Then he gave this call of action, in which I'm going to do with you as we close. He gave this call of action to folks, OK? So, He's going to encourage people to continue to march for certain things. And so when I point to you all, you're just going to say, let us march, OK? Let us therefore continue our triumphant march to the realization of the American dream. Let us, let us march on segregated housing until every ghetto or social and economic depression dissolves and Negroes and whites live side by side in decent, safe, and sanitary housing. Let us march. Let us march on segregated schools until every vestige of segregated and inferior education becomes a thing of the past, and Negroes and whites study side by side in the socially healing context of the classroom. Let us march. Let us march on poverty until no American parent has to skip a meal 
so that their children may eat. Let's my <laughs> Let us march on poverty until no starved man walks the street of our city and towns in search of jobs that don't exist. Let us march. Let us march on poverty until wrinkled stomachs in Mississippi, and this was like a personal thing for me because that's where my people are from, from Mississippi. Let us march on, a po on poverty until wrinkled stomachs in Mississippi, he said, I feel, and the idle industries of Appalachia are realized and revitalized, and broken lives in sweltering ghettos are mended and remolded. Let us march. Let us march on ballot boxes until race baiters disappear from the public arena. Let, Let us march. Let us march on ballot boxes until the salient misdeeds of bloodthirsty mobs will be transformed into the calculated good deeds of orderly citizens. Let us march. Let us march on the ballot boxes until the George Wallaces of our nation tremble away in silence. Let us, march. Yeah, thank you. Let us march on the ballot boxes until we send to our city councils, state legislators, and the United States Congress men who, and women, I'm going to put that in, Martin didn't say women, but I'm going to add that in, and women <laughs> who will not fear to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. Let us march. march. And let us march on ballot boxes until brotherhood becomes more than a meaningless word in an opening prayer, but the order of the day on every legislative agenda. Let us march.